Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're getting ready for our last set of talks today, which is going to be a, a FreeBSD Foundation technical roadmap update from Ed, along with a couple other talks that Ed will introduce. So I'm going to turn it over to Ed now. Thanks, John. Uh, let me just get this shared here. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the FreeBSD Foundation's technical roadmap, um, and then we'll have updates uh, from Matt Ahrens and from Mark Johnston uh, on two foundation-sponsored projects. So we'll start off here with a little note on staff. As Deb mentioned in the introduction yesterday, we've, um, we've sort of doubled our uh, foundation staff in, in about a year or so. Um, we've brought on five new people, uh, part-time or full-time. Um, and so we've, uh, as a result of our kind of, um, sustained donation base, um, we've been able to ramp up the projects that we're going to take on the work that we're going to do, um, within the foundation directly. Um, so we also are investigating or evaluating, um, some open, uh, potential open roles on container uh, container development and continuous integration and build um, work. And we also, uh, on a regular basis, hire two or three co-op students from the University of Waterloo. Um, it's basically a four-month internship, and we expect that we'll do that again in the future. We don't currently have uh, interns working for the foundation this term, but uh, I expect we will again. So onto the roadmap, uh, I've shared this in a blog post on the foundation site that I'll link to um, in a little bit uh, later in, the, um, in this talk, but uh, mainly the foundation's goal is to fill in gaps that aren't being um, addressed in the broader community. So we, base, we wanna find out what areas uh, are needed in FreeBSD development that aren't happening through uh, you know, perhaps organic development or um, either community efforts or work that's being done within various companies um, to support and improve FreeBSD. And we learn uh, and shape this, uh, this roadmap based on feedback from company visits, from discussions with the FreeBSD core team, uh, with the community, the FreeBSD community at conferences and such and so on. Um, and I'll have a little bit more um, to talk about uh, on feedback uh, in a moment, um, but we've uh, we've focused. We've decided that there's sort of four areas of focus um, that we want to put effort into over the next few years, um, and they're broadly speaking: end user, um, laptop and desktop use cases, uh, commodity server, um, toolkit and appliance, and virtualization and containers. And so I'll get into each of these um, very briefly. So the first item uh, up is, is end user roadmap. And uh, one of the pieces of feedback we've been hearing from many, many people in uh, many venues is that Wi-Fi support on FreeBSD is lacking and is very important. Um, and to that end, we've brought Bjorn Zeeb on to uh, first work on bringing the, um, the Intel uh, dual license drivers to FreeBSD to support newer uh, the contemporary Intel Wi-Fi devices, and that that work is um, is about ready to be merged into FreeBSD uh, main, and then we'll we'll get merged into existing um, stable branches uh, afterwards. Um, and once that's complete, uh, Bjorn will continue working on um, support for new uh, new Wi-Fi standards and, and such. Um, and this is something that. Uh, on an ongoing basis, um, you know, wi -Fi, supporting Wi-Fi is something that the foundation is uh, is definitely sees as important and is is committed to taking on. Um, we also one of the interns that we had over the last uh, summer term worked on a proof of proof of concept for a new FreeBSD installer, um, looking at uh, ways that that could be modernized or rethought. Um, this work is not necessarily something that's going to make it into FreeBSD, but it was a, an experimental process to determine uh, what we might be able to do. And I think this will, will continue. We'll see um, working, with, working with the FreeBSD community to see 
if this is something that um, will, will form a good basis for um, modernizing and updating the installer um, or pursuing different avenues. Um, the one other item I'll, I'll want to call out uh, on here is ports and packages and specifically package base. Um, the package base project is, is it's not a foundation project. It's um, entirely being uh, driven within the FreeBSD community. Um, but it's, it is something that we recognize as being important for FreeBSD's future and uh, are very interested in supporting it and um, contributing what's necessary to sort of bring it along uh, across the finish line. Uh, next item, the commodity server uh, support. This is something that FreeBSD has been you know, clearly well known for for quite a long time um, as a, a stable uh, server operating system. Um, and so the tier one CPU support, you know, it's, um, it's a fairly easy, um, simple bullet point, um, but you can see that it, uh, it runs across the entire roadmap. And this basically covers um, bug fixes and performance improvements and stability uh, updates and all sorts of things that are, um, uh, that we support to just keep the, um, keep FreeBSD on historically x86 and also uh, in the future ARM64 um, as a, a stable and performant operating system. Um, this is, a lot of this is the work that Caustic does on an ongoing basis, um, just improving the VM system and fixing, uh, fixing ongoing bugs and, and supporting uh, contributors to FreeBSD by reviewing code and, and things of that nature and other foundation staff as well. Um, second item um, I'll point out on here is ARM64 is tier one. So this is um, shown here as sort of two years worth of work. Um, and this doesn't mean that at the end of that period, we're not gonna focus on uh, ARM64 anymore, but effectively, this is the work that's sort of um, ongoing as part of ARM64 as a new, uh, new tier one architecture. And after that time, uh, supporting ARM64 will just be part of the ongoing uh, aspect of tier one CPU support. And so this includes uh, support for new ISA level features, security mitigations, and such like uh, such topics like that, um, that are specific to ARM64. Next, uh, toolkit and appliance. And right now, our focus, um, as Moritz, uh, the Moritz talk uh, yesterday went went into, uh, our focus is on improving LLDB and bringing us to having a full uh, modern, con full full contemporary, permissively licensed toolchain in the base system. So many people uh, in the FreeBSD community and in the foundation have worked on updating our tool chain for quite some time um, to, a, to a permissively licensed modern tool chain, uh, but GDB, the debugger, uh, was, was a bit of a straggler. And uh, we have LLDB in the base system now, and have we've put some effort into bringing LLDB up to, um, uh, up to parity with GDB as a um, for base system user land debugging, uh, but one of the outstanding items was kernel core debugging. Um, LLDB uh, until this project had no support for debugging FreeBSD kernel um, kernel cores or live kernel debugging. And so this is uh, this project is uh, essentially bringing uh, completing the last item on the migration to um, to a LLVM. Uh, LLDB rather as part of the the full toolchain update, and there will be ongoing uh, support and work on other LLDB, uh, other LLDB topics and other toolchain topics. But um, the, this is is sort of the final piece um, of the overall uh, specifically identified toolchain update story. Um, our goal after that work is completed. Um, and perhaps in you know with some some additional follow on LLDB updates, but our our um, goal following goal is going to be looking at performance tooling and making sure that we have we have tools um, that are easy to use and uh, useful for identifying bottlenecks in uh, in an uh, application developer's contributed code. 
And then finally, um, container, containers and virtualization. Um, we, uh, we've brought Caho uh, uh, on. Caho worked as, a, uh, as an intern for the foundation for a while um, and, and is now working full time um, and is going to look at a, a variety of, of things in FreeBSD. Um, but one of the um, one of the specific topics is is going to be looking at some improvements um, and and support for uh, for Beehive the virtualization the hypervisor in FreeBSD um, and then we're also evaluating and researching um, support for containerization um, things like uh, Samuel Carp's RunJ project and networking support for virtualization so. This is more of a, um, a research and investigation project at the moment, um, and through the course of uh, the rest of this year, early in, early next year, um, we expect to figure out what it is that we're going to, to work on supporting and then um, contribute uh, development efforts for the next couple of years, uh, bringing those to fruition. So I mentioned before um, that we're very interested in feedback on the roadmap and on our priorities. Um, so I have a link here, uh, freebsdfoundation.org slash blog slash technology dash roadmap to the blog that uh, blog post that talks about the roadmap that I just described. Um, and uh, an email address here, tech team at freebsdfoundation.org. So I'm very interested in hearing, um, you know, if there's items on here that you think are uh, or should be higher or lower priority, or if there are additional items that should be included in our roadmap but are not currently, you know, please let let us know. And this this email uh, alias goes to the uh, the entire FreeBSD Foundation um, tech staff. Finally, another uh, item that Deb alluded to in the introduction um, is that we have a call for proposals coming out shortly. Um, so we're we're always interested in receiving proposals for project grants to fund, um, but we're going to do a we're going to um, uh, to issue a specific call for proposals uh, in the near future. And this isn't um, only this isn't limited to base system, uh, you know, kernel changes or user land. Uh, I've listed a, a number of different possibilities here, um, but certainly you know we're interested in proposals um, for uh, third-party software as well, um, either uh, or uh, proposals for work in the ports collection, or even documentation or services related to FreeBSD supporting the community, um, any of those sorts of uh, sorts of things. Um, so, what I would suggest is for um, uh, for software development proposals, definitely review the roadmap and uh, see if there's anything that fits into the themes of the roadmap. Um, we're, we're particularly interested in software proposals that fit into the, to those areas um, and uh, are, are also very interested in non-development proposals. And with that said, I will um, maybe open it up to questions for just a, a moment or two before moving on to the um, two updates on specific foundation projects that uh, Matt and Mark will go into. So one question we had from IRC, I think, because you talked about Beehive, um, is uh, you know Peter Crehan kind of stepped down as a as one of the Beehive maintainers earlier this week. So are there any plans from the foundation to try to fund someone with time to look at that? Um, I know I am woefully behind on trying to review Beehive things myself. So there's definitely a backlog of uh, maintainer related work around Beehive. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, Kaho is working on some specific technical developments um, for Beehive support. Um, I think that the the question about sort of um, you know a, a higher level uh, question about Beehive maintenance going forward and you know sort of managing the um, the the roadmap for Beehive specifically um, is a is a tougher question. Uh, it is certainly something that. Uh, you know we're we're willing to to support if um, if it looks like that's necessary for um, uh, for Beehive's continued success. So uh, definitely that's something that um, that we'll be looking at.
I had another question over on Discord. Um, Vince had asked, uh, what is the status of Beehive on ARM, if you want to speak to that? Um, so that's a, another good question, yes. Um, uh, so uh, Andy Turner is one of the, the new, um, uh, new people working for, well, one of the people newly working for the foundation um, of late. Um, and so far, he's worked on a few um, ARM64 ISA level features, um, so support for things like um, pointer authentication and branch target in, uh, identifiers, um, branch, branch target identification, uh, a couple of security mitigation features. Um, but uh, coming up uh, quite soon on his to-do list is to um, to work on integrating the ARM64 Beehive uh, patches that exist out of Tree now and bringing them into uh, into FreeBSD. So I think that's probably it for questions, John. Yeah, I don't see any others. I think you can probably move on to your to the next two talks. All right. So uh, first up, we have um, Matt Ahrens uh, with a, a an update on RAID Z expansion. Cool. Thanks, Ed. Let me get my slides here. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Matt Ahrens. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my work on the RAIDS expansion project, which is sponsored by the FreeBSD Foundation. Um, Ed, I should ask, how long do you uh, have for my section? You can have several minutes. Okay. But this is kind of the last session of the day, well, too, so I wouldn't stress I'll, about it. I'll try to zip through the what it is and get to the status. Um, so. The, the pro this is the problem that the project is trying to solve. Um, you have a ZFS storage pool that's full, and uh, maybe it's a RAID Z storage pool. And um, the way that you would like to solve this problem is not by buying a whole bunch of new disks and hardware, uh, but by adding maybe one or maybe two disks to your RAID Z group, uh, which you cannot do today, but this project enables. So, um, the way that you'll be able to do it is uh, zpool attach. You add just this one new disk to the RAID Z group. Um, it, it takes a little while because it has to move all of the data uh, in the storage pool. So zpool status shows you uh, the progress. Uh, while it's in progress, um, the space available is still just what it was originally. But when you wait for the expansion to complete, then um, you get this updated status message. And now more space is available. Um, I wanted to point out the difference here between uh, the space usage in ZFS list and ZPool list. Um, the accounting there is a little different. So this is like uh, what is available for allocation at the kind of block allocator level. And it includes space used by the parity information versus this is like kind of more logical how much space is available. Um, so I mentioned that it takes a little while because we have to re we have to move all the data um, under the hood. Uh, what's happening is um, you're adding a new disk. So like in this example, you have four disks. You're adding one new disk. Um, we don't we need the free space to be spread out over all of the disks so that the data in parity can also be spread out over all the disks for new allocations. Um, so we do this by reflowing the allocated blocks. So in this example, each like logical row is a different color here. And we're kind of like renumbering it. So um, sector five here has to move to the new disk. And then the, the next six, seven, eight is like shifted over. Um, and as a result of this reflow, now you have a bunch of free space um, that's spread out over all the disks. Um, so this is what's happening while the uh, expansion is in progress. Um, so this works, uh, kind of works as you might hope in a lot of respects, um, it works with all different kinds of RAID Z. So RAID Z 1, 2, or 3, whatever starting width you want. And you can expand multiple times. So you can go from 4 wide to 5 wide to 6 wide to 7 wide, et cetera. Um, the uh, old data continues to have the old data to parity ratio. So like if you start with a RAID Z 1 that's 4 wide, you know you have three pieces of data for every one piece of parity. Um, the old data maintains that. 
um, but newly written data after the expansion completes will have the new uh, the new ratio of you know maybe four pieces of data to one piece of metadata or one piece of parity. Um, while this is while the expansion is going on, the data copying is going on. Um, the disks the, the the pool has to remain healthy. Um, if something goes wrong, uh, like one of the disks in the RAID Z dies, then the reflow will pause while um, the uh, until it's reconstructed. So uh, it all works like you know your uh, integrity is still in place while uh, the reflow is in progress. It's just that it's going to pause. Um, until you uh, replace the broken disk with a new one, and then it's resilvered, and then the um, reflow will automatically continue. Uh, performance. So uh, performance uh, after the expansion is in the same ballpark as it was before. Um, a little bit uh, fast. Writes are a little bit faster because there's less parity to write. Uh, reads are a little bit slower because we end up having to read the parity because of how the data was reorganized. Um, the big kind of caveat here is that the expansion itself goes very slowly. Um, this is a worst case uh, kind of scenario uh, where you're using uh, 512 byte sector drives. Uh, with 4K sector drives, this expansion performance basically is gonna be 8X faster, uh, which is much more tolerable. Um, but uh, there, there, we have some ideas of how we could improve that in the future. All right, so where are we at? Uh, this is fully implemented. It works. Uh, we've added tests. Uh, the, the pull request is open. Um, and uh, all, uh, well, the tests pass. Uh, I'm working on finding one last, hopefully last, uh, bug. Um, there's a few minor to-dos that I'll be working on in the coming month, um, uh, writing some more comments to explain how the code works. Uh, and, and some minor cleanup, but uh, we do need uh, or can use some help to get this across the finish line faster. Um, testing, so uh, the the tests there are automated tests added, but obviously they can't cover every uh, possible thing that you might think of doing, and the automated tests have to run you know within a limited amount of time uh, because they're run for uh, you know on every pull request. Um, so uh, more manual testing with you know larger pools, I/O in progress while the expansion happens, um, failing disks while the expansion happens uh, would would definitely be appreciated and uh, reports of problems uh, on the pull request. And uh, the other big thing that we need is code review. So this is something that obviously I cannot do myself. Um, we need uh, other people to review the code um, before it's integrated. Um, and that's what that's the main thing that I'm looking for at this point. Uh, these are some questions that I've been asked uh, often as part of this project. Uh, so there's a bunch of things that people would like to see that either are um, would would be natural future work like improving the performance of the reflow. Um, maybe if you want to add multiple drives at once, um, having that be one operation rather than several. Um, and then there's other other things that uh, are not really that don't really work with this design. So things like adding, uh, increasing the amount of parity, uh, or removing disks, or defragmenting, or like turning mirrors into grade Z. Um, those are all neat ideas and things to want, but this design doesn't really um, help us to get towards those. Uh, if you want to learn more about this project and kind of how it works internally, I gave a talk this summer at the FreeBSD Developer Summit. Um, and there's a video and slides uh, linked there. Yeah, so uh, thanks to the FreeBSD Foundation for sponsoring this work. Uh, it's yeah, I've been working on this for several years, uh, much longer than um, we initially thought it would take. So thanks a lot to them for uh, sticking with this. And um, thanks to other contributors, Fedor uh, from VStack, who's done a lot of testing and, and, and uncovered a lot of tricky bugs, and Stuart, um, who also helped with uh, writing tests. If you want to learn more about other ZFS projects, um, OpenZFS uh, is, is FreeBSD ZFS. And uh, we have monthly meetings. The next one's coming up in a few weeks. And we just had our annual conference um, a couple weeks ago. And the videos for that are all now online. So uh, you might want to check that out.
that's all that I had. Happy to take questions if we have time. Thanks, Matt. Uh, let's see if there's any questions in any of the various spots. Do you see any questions, John? No, <clears throat> none so far. And I do remember your talk from this June too, with how it works. So, <clears throat> yeah, the main uh, update from them from then is the status. Um, it's it's basically ready, ready, you know, ready to go with some very minor caveats. Um, I think that when I gave that talk last summer, it was like I opened the pull request this morning. Um, uh, so yes. you know. We're, we're a little bit more baked since then, um, but still do need uh, work from the community to uh, code review and, and get integrated. And um, you know the other things are, are minor things that I'll be, be able to take care of in the next month or so. So we did get a question on Discord actually, Discord, uh, which is what someone asked, what if not one of the existing disks, but what if the new disk fails um, during mid-add? Is, like, is that any different? Yeah, that's not really any different. Um, it would still pause the expansion and wait for that disk to be replaced. Or, um, you know, if it, if it just like if the cable came loose, you can plug the cable back in and then it'll keep going. Um, it kind of the, the normal ZFS rules about getting the pool healthy again will apply. So it'll it, it can do like a partial resilver if the disk comes back or if you have to replace the disk, then it'll do a full resilver um, and then the expansion will continue. Okay, I think that's all the questions that I can see. All right, thanks. The update, Matt, and good luck on finding reviewers. I uh, I know how hard it is to get reviews on large, complicated changes. Yeah, it's, it is. It is a big, complicated change. Um, I mean, I I have tried to leave the code better than I found it. Um, the Raid Z code, especially the the math and the and the reconstruction handling, is is very complicated. Um, I I already landed a bunch of like. Uh, code reorganization um, stuff. So, you know, the diff is not like as huge as it could be, but there's still uh, a lot of tricky stuff in there. All right, thank you. And then um, next up, uh, we have Mark Johnston. There we go with a update on uh, work on SysCaller. Hello, uh, can you see my camera okay? Yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, so, hello, uh, my name is Mark Johnston. I work for the FreeBSD Foundation. Um, I do quite a few different things, but um, for the past uh, couple of years, and especially in the past few months, I've spent a lot of time working with uh, SysCaller. Um, so uh, I wanted to give a, a brief status update and, and just kind of overview of what SysCaller is. Um, I've talked about it several times in the past. I think this is probably my third or fourth talk. So uh, uh, apologies if you've if you've heard a bit too much about it already. But um, I, I think it's a, a very important project to FreeBSD and to operating systems in general. Um, and uh, I, I think we get quite a lot of benefit uh, uh, directly out of it. Uh, so I, I want to I, I can't pass up an opportunity to talk about it a little bit more and uh, uh, just quickly present an overview. Um, uh, obviously, I don't have a lot of time, uh, so I just want to go through it kind of quickly. There's there's quite a lot of information in the uh, syscall repo, the, the first link in this first slide here, um, which with, which contains references to documentation. Uh, uh, but just getting into it, it's it's to quote the author, an unsupervised coverage guided kernel fuzzer, uh, and what that looks like in our case is basically you boot up your target operating system in a in a virtual machine, and then an agent. Uh, running in that virtual machine is responsible for generating random programs and running them and uh, getting some feedback from the kernel about which pieces of code were executed within that kernel and using that information to refine uh, the, the search. Uh, so syscaller uh, contains a, a whole bunch of components to enable this. It, it you know, uh, starts VMs, it generates programs, it has detailed knowledge of the system call interface. Um, 
but that, that, that's the basic kind of loop. It, it generates random programs, runs them. If the system crashed, then OK, great, it found a bug. Um, if it didn't, uh, use information from the use, use signal from the from the kernel to, to figure out if, if it makes sense to try and mutate the program slightly. Maybe it makes sense to try running multiple copies of the program in parallel. Um, all sorts of transformations which can which can uncover bugs. So it's very, very, very good at uh, uncovering corner cases, bugs, and error handling, concurrency bugs, things that a lot of basic testing uh, tend to miss. Um, and moreover, it does that fairly quickly. Uh, one of the other really important things that it does is when it does find a crash, it generates a standalone C program um, to reproduce that crash. So developers who want to work on the bug um, have, a, have a nice handy reproducer available. Um, this is not 100% reliable, but it, it, it does tend to work quite well. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example of, uh, of a reproducer in a, in a subsequent slide. Uh, so Syscaller was developed uh, by Dimitri Fiukov at Google, um, and Google kindly hosts um, a public Syscaller instance um, on, their, on, their, uh, on the Google Compute platform. Um, so you can visit that link and see statuses uh, for, for a number of different operating systems. Uh, Syscaller was initially developed for Linux, and it's found uh, you know, thousands of bugs there. Um, but uh, Dimitri has since added support for other operating systems, so you can use it to bugs for BSD. All of the BSDs, um, uh, possibly with the exception of Dragonfly BSD, I don't think I've seen them added as a target, but it does. It's uh, Fuchsia, Darwin, um, I think even Windows now. So there's there's quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of uh, coverage there. Um, it finds a lot of corner case bugs, like I said, maybe maybe things that are relatively low impact. Um, but it also, in my experience, has found some fairly severe bugs in FreeBSD, bugs that have uh, security implications or bugs that would have been um, quite difficult to track down um, uh, otherwise. Um, this year, I also spent some time porting kernel sanitizers to FreeBSD from NetBSD, and those also uh, complement um, uh, Syscaller quite a bit because uh, they, they tend to cause bugs to be revealed earlier than they would otherwise be. So a use after free might result in memory corruption that causes a crash. Um, but with the kernel address sanitizer enabled, you can maybe catch that use, use after free as it's happening. And so you, you spend less time debugging and the problem is more plain. Um, so Syscaller is um, a very good way of finding some, some types of bugs. Um, it, it's definitely not comprehensive. It won't tell you if the kernel is behaving correctly. It only really tells you if the kernel crashes. So it's um, an important part of, I think, any operating system <clears throat> testing regime, but it's it's not on its own sufficient. Um, and just finally, uh, it, again, going into the the uh, document or into the Syscall repo, there's a docs directory with lots of information, including um, links to various research papers um, that have been uh, that, that that are based on Syscall. Various research groups have taken it and extended it and used it to to expose some class of bugs. Um, and there's, there's quite a lot of active development and, and research going on today. So even though it's been around since I think around 2016 or so, um, and, and, and you know many, many bugs have been fixed, uh, it's still generating a large volume of reports and all the operating systems that, that it targets. Um, so on FreeBSD, just very quickly, we have this uh, SysManager um, agent, which controls VMs in which the, the fuzzer actually runs. Fuzzers are responsible for creating uh, random programs. Uh, the, the fuzzer itself is written in Go and uses an IPC-based interface with a, a C++ program called SysExecutor, which uh, takes a, a list of system calls to execute and, and parameters for them. Um, and so when Syscaller does find a crash, it generates a reproducer that looks something like this. So on the top, we have the, the so-called syslang repro, um, which is uh, a sequence of system calls with parameters. Uh, this is written in uh, Syscaller's own um, kind of machine, machine independent format for representing system calls. Um, and then uh, there's a program within the suite that translates that to a C program that you can compile and run. So I chose this one just because it's fairly simple. It doesn't use multiple threads or anything like that. It's just a single sequence of system calls that on FreeBSD um, used to trigger a bug, I think, in the raw socket. Um, code, uh, which has since been fixed. Um, but this is the, the kind of output that you get from it. So just running this um, on, a, on, a, on certain revisions of FreeBSD will trigger a kernel panic. 
Um, so where have we gotten to so far? Um, uh, it's, it's difficult to estimate you know, the, the true number of bugs that it's found and fixed. I, I would say about 150, um, just based on the, because syscaller can find the same bug in multiple ways. So there, there's some duplication that happens. Um, so a lot of those have been fixed in the past few months. Um, like I said, I've been working um, a, a fair bit to try and drive down the, the, uh, the backlog of open bugs that was found by the syslot, sysbot uh, public syscaller instance. Um, so we're in we're in a pretty good place right now, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll show the website in a little a little bit just to just to give a sense for for what's been found, um, but uh, it's it's found in the past few years uh, a number of like I said severe bugs, and I just gave one example here which which uh, I chose it just happens to stick out in my memory. It's a callout bug that I that I fixed uh, exactly one year ago to this day. Um, a callout is a structure that we use in the kernel for requesting that a, a function be executed at some point in the future. Um, so you know it's it's used extensively for timeouts and, and things like that. Um, it's a fairly complicated subsystem, and uh, there there was a bug uh, lurking in there in a special case where we migrate a callout from one CPU to another. Um, so syscaller happened to find that bug and generated a reproducer for it, uh, and and uh, the, the bug itself. I think would result in use after free and, and some subsequent memory corruption. Um, in short, it's the sort of thing that would have been extremely painful to track down uh, if it occurred in production. Um, I did find a couple of reports of uh, what I believe was the same bug in our bugzilla, um, but without a reproducer, this sort of thing is, is again, extremely painful to, to track down. It would have taken a lot of time. It took me I think a full day, and that was with you know a single program to trigger the panic on demand. Um, so that's an example of the, the sort of impact that Syscaller has. Uh, it helps us find and fix bugs before users happen to, even if the bugs themselves are fairly trivial or, or you know, don't have any particularly serious implication. Um, it's it's really important to make sure that we uh, that we. Uh, that we keep FreeBSD as stable as possible, right? I mean, we don't even even developers shouldn't be spending time trying to track down kernel regressions that happen in the development branch. Um, Syscaller helps us get those bugs fixed, get those regressions out um, out of the developer branch uh, a lot sooner than than we might otherwise. Um, and so I think it's very valuable in that it, it saves quite a lot of developer time over time. Uh, in addition to fixing, you know, these these fairly serious bugs that that impact uh, production workloads, uh, and in the past few months, the results have been pretty heartening. Um, I keep an eye on the public Sysbot uh, dashboard, and when regression, uh, which, which and that the Sysbot instance rebuilds the FreeBSD kernel uh, once a day or so, it just pulls the latest sources from the development branch automatically, um, uh, automatically updates all the fuzzer VMs, and then they they start running with updated code. So when new bugs get introduced, they get found pretty quickly, and uh, I, I tend to either just forward the report to to uh, maintainers, or, or I'll just fix it myself. And um, as a result, we've we've been getting bug fixes in uh, very quickly. So uh, rather than having a user or a developer hit a panic and then go through the trouble of uh, debugging or, or trying to figure out what's going on, um, we're getting those bugs fixed proactively. Uh, so. The Sysbot backlog currently has about 70 open bugs. Um, a lot of them are in the SCP code, and I've been working with Michael Tuxen to try and get those down. Um, there's a few others that we're also working on. I'm hoping to get that nearly that backlog nearly empty by the end of the year. Um, a few months ago, it was quite a bit larger. Um, no one had been spending a lot of time kind of going through and, and identifying issues and, and resolving them. Uh, so we're, we're in a pretty good spot right now, I think. Uh, there's quite a lot of Additional directions we can go with Syscaller and FreeBSD, and I'd be really interested in talking to anyone that's that's interested in, in working on uh, working on uh, this area. Uh, so, just to give some examples here, uh, I had a GSOC student somewhere in Kapalia um, over the summer who did some work to get uh, Syscaller working so that it could fuzz the Linux emulator. So, Syscaller fuzzes Linux, of course. It has a comprehensive knowledge of the system of the Linux system call interface. Um, so the idea is basically to just use that and have syscaller pretend that it's fuzzing a Linux kernel and see what happens when you run it under the Linux simulator. Um, so we've actually found several bugs that way. 
and uh, um, I'm hoping to complete the work that she did and, and get that into the uh, upstream syscaller uh, repository so that we can actually uh, start using that um, easily. Um, Andy Turner did, uh, uh, I think it's still a work in progress ARM64 port, but uh, I believe it's, it's mostly functional, just some uh, cleanup work that needs to be done. So it'd be really nice to get that uh, fixed. Um, I'm just based on the uh, Ampere um, presentation that we saw earlier today, I'm, I'm curious to see if we can use the uh, free instances in the Oracle Cloud to, uh, to act as uh, fuzzer VMs. So I, I, I've started trying to get that working, but um, any, any, um, uh, any progress on this PR would be, uh, would be appreciated. Um, I've also been asked about the RISC-V port. Uh, so Syscaller is written mostly in Go, except for the actual executor component that I mentioned earlier, which is written in C++. Um, we don't have Go support on RISC-V at the moment, but it does exist for Linux. So I don't think it would be a, a particularly large project to uh, have a RISC-V port. Um, and so if, if anyone's interested in that, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to direct you to, to uh, uh, some of the risk five developers who, who might be able to uh, help out. Uh, one other thing I've been looking at recently is uh, testing uh, syscaller with ZFS. So, so far all of my testing has been done with UFS. Um, and that's largely because it's, it's quite a bit easier to create UFS based VM images in our, in our infrastructure. Um, it, it is of course possible to create ZFS based images, but um, I believe at the moment you can't do that uh, in a jail because the, the, the method that I've seen used most often is to create a couple of memory disks and then create a pool on that, create data sets, and then unmount. Um, but that's, that's not really possible in a jail. Um, Syscaller uh, can be used in a jail, um, or it can be run in a jail, and that's a, that's a pretty convenient way for, uh, to, to uh, maintain multiple instances. Uh, so having a more streamlined process for creating ZFS-based VM images uh, would be uh, would be very helpful and I'd be really interested in talking to anyone who uh, has some idea on how that should work. Basically, I want something like MakeFS um, to work with ZFS, but I don't quite know what's involved yet. Um, and also relevant to the pre-commit CI conversations that we've been having is uh, uh, a setup to enable um, running syscaller with, with work in progress packets. So rather than having uh, this model where sysbot pulls the development branch every day, Builds a kernel and runs a bunch of tests. Um, we, we would ideally be able to run uh, uh, patch sets under syscaller for say a day or two before committing, just to flesh out any any uh, uh, regressions. And uh, that's uh, all I had uh, from the slides. And I just want to quickly show what the uh, the Sysbot dashboard or Sysbot dashboard looks like. Um, so there's a number of different operating systems targeted uh, or, or that are that are continuously being fuzzed by Syscaller. Um, this is the the FreeBSD dashboard. We still have a fairly large number of bugs open. Like I said, um, I'm hoping to to get that down. Many of them do have reproducers. Um, quite a few of these have actually already been fixed. Um, you can see, for instance, that the last occurrence of some of these bugs was was quite a long time ago. Uh, which strongly suggests that uh, they, they, they were resolved one way or another. Um, and you can also, uh, if, if you're curious, take a look at all the bugs that have been fixed um, over the past couple of years in, uh, uh, in, this, in this panel here. And uh, oops. And uh, that's uh, all I had on that. Um, were there any questions? So one question we had from IRC is, does Syscaller benefit from using multiple sanitizers together? Um, I mean, it, it, it depends. Um, so some sanitizers just simply aren't compatible with each other um, for, for kind of low level technical reasons. In fact, um, Syscaller depends on the use of the coverage sanitizer. So the way it gets uh, coverage information from the kernel um, is that it uses uh, uh, an interface called KCOV and uh, that paired with the, the LVM's um, coverage sanitizer 
um, allows it to, to gather coverage information. So you can use that together with, for instance, the address sanitizer, the memory sanitizer, and, and we do that today. So for instance, Sysbot runs with uh, KA scan enabled unconditionally, um, and I'm gonna be adding KM SAN support um, in, the, in the near future as well. Uh, so in, in some sense, yes, but sometimes it doesn't make sense to combine sanitizers. Like you can't combine address and memory sanitizers together. The, the implementation just doesn't support it. Another question, like I think about how to freeze it. It says, um, oh, I, I think I understand. Can Linux emulator says caller functions find potentially find bugs in Linux? I guess you know if we find a bug in a Linux ABI, is it potentially a bug in Linux as well? Um, like I don't know, it, but I guess put another way, you would maybe try to have Sysbot if it finds that a, a given Linux test binary blows up on FreeBSD, does it try to run the same binary on Linux? Might be an experiment they could try to do. So yeah, that, that would that would certainly be interesting. Um, one experiment that they've been doing is, um, so there, there are multiple Linux implementations, right? We have the Linux kernel itself and we have GVisor, which is a, a user space implementation of the uh, Linux kernel binary interface. So you can basically run everything in user mode. Um, so one thing that they've been working on, I don't know the status of it, uh, specifically is, you know, running test, run, generate a single test program, run it against both Linux and GVisor and see if the results differ in some interesting way. So for instance, different error no values um, might indicate that there's a compatibility bug in GVisor, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I don't think a bug in our Linux emulator found by syscaller would really tell you anything about Linux itself. Um, and you know, if you were to do a comparison, then you know any any difference in behavior um, would effectively be a bug in, in FreeBSD. So I, I think yes. Uh, I, circling back to the original question, I think th there is some additional um, benefit that we could get out of fuzzing the Linux later, besides just discovering kernel discovering bugs that would lead to a kernel panic. You could, you could in principle use it to, to find incompatible input, incompatible implementations as well. Uh, but I don't know the, the status of that work with respect to Linux and GVisor. So I don't know if it's uh, very easy to consume yet. Okay. <clears throat> we have one more question, I think related to your question about using MakeFS for ZFS. Um, uh, they asked, and this is from IRC, would it make sense to try to use the ZFS jail subcommand to make ZFS available in the jail via MakeFS? Um, I don't think that would really help me here because what I, what I really want to do is just make a pool. Um, gotcha. And as I understand, well, I think that's the, the kind of, like if I wanted to make, a simple VM image that would boot under Beehive. I don't see an approach that doesn't involve creating a, a, a Z pool, creating a few data sets on it, and then uh, uh, booting from that. Um, and the problem is that creation of Z pools is administratively, administratively prohibited uh, in a jail. Like it, the, the kernel simply doesn't permit it. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure why that should be disallowed. Like, um, would it make sense to perhaps enable the use case of creating memory disks in a jail and then creating a Z pool on those disks? I'm not sure. You could imagine at least if we, if that's the route you wanted to take, um, we, we have a whole way to add new knobs for jails, right? You can allow things. So you could at least add a knob to ZFS to, on a given jail, you could turn on the ability to create Z pools in that jail. And then you could do the MD thing inside that jail at least. And you could have, you know, Build jails where you turn this on. It's still somewhat convoluted to use MD to do all this, but that means yeah. I'm trying to shove all of ZFS into MakeFS. I mean, I guess there is libZFS, but I don't know how much of I don't know enough of the internals to know if that would allow you to write make if, to do it in MakeFS style or not. Well, I know that a lot of the open ZFS code base can be compiled in user space, and that's done for testing purposes. But I don't know if anyone's tried to enable any any real functionality that way. So I guess that's what I'm most curious about. 
that may be a good question for an OpenZFS monthly call, actually. Mm -hmm. Perhaps yeah. rather than here. I mean, that is something I think that would be an example of a great project um, proposal to come in as well in the the um, the call for proposals. Um, you know, I think user land ZFS image creation um, is uh, via MakeFS is something that would be um, very useful for for many use cases. Another thing that I've prototyped doing was um, booting a kernel with uh, MD root and then just pass in the devices that I want to create an image from and then basically create the image in the VM itself, shut down the VM and then, and then use that. Um, but that's, that's again, a bit complicated to set up for the build pipeline. So I'll check. I don't think I saw any other questions on IRC for you, Mark. I'll give folks a chance to ask questions of Ed, though, if they have any other kind of general questions about foundation work that they want to ask Ed.